Hey everyone, and welcome to Behind the Mask. I'm one of your co-hosts, EJ, and joining me today are my friends, Lori Hello. and T. Hello. This is episode six. We're calling Masks and Etiquette of Invisible Illness, part two. Just a friendly reminder that anything discussed in this podcast is not to be used as a diagnosis or a replacement for conversations with your own doctors, therapists, psychologists, or other medical professionals. Take it away, Lori. <laughs> All right, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to do that or right Okay. So we left off last week mentioning something called spoon theory. So I guess I'll ask you, T, and you, EJ, what do you know about the spoon theory? The first time I heard about the spoon theory is when I was a part of a support group for caregivers of those who were uh, chronically ill. And um, often t saw other members refer to the spoon uh, theory. And what I understood of it is, it's like we're all given a certain amount of spoons and it's like a certain amount of tools available to deal with something. And each time we deal with something, we're using a spoon and eventually we can run out of spoons. That's, yeah. That's what I understood. Okay, pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, for me, I, um, I think of the first time and only time I really ever heard of it was when I was in the chronic illness group first, first joined it with you, Lori. Um, and somebody had talked about it. Um, and you know, basically the, you know, your day is broken up into X amount of spoons and certain things that we do during the day cost so many spoons. And your goal is to have some spoons left over at the end of the night. But for those who are normal, that can often happen. But for people who have a chronic illness, um, sometimes it might take more spoons to get an, a project or an activity done and, you know, uh, they get used up a lot quicker. Yes. Um, so then by the end of like, by four o'clock, you may have used all your spoons and you've still got eight hours to go until right. bedtime. Right. Um, oh, that and, makes so much more sense. Yes. Yeah. And I, it, it really helps put in perspective, um, because, you know, I am chronically ill. And though I have an invisible illness or several, it's easy to, I want to say this, it's, uh, it's easy to think that all the things I have to do today have to get done today. Um, but there are things that can be done the next day. Like you don't have to do every load of laundry today. Like it could be one load today and one load tomorrow. Um, just simple things like that. And, um, so it's, it's helped me be mindful of, all that I am doing and teaching me boundaries. All right. So, um, I was leading my, my first, um, when I was working with you, Tina at, at, uh, that very first, wow, the words are escaping me, but your very first clinic, I guess, if you will. Yes. Um, so I was leading, uh, living richly and fully with chronic illness and I had heard you know, um, through some of my research of this spoon theory. So I went to check it out because I'm like, spoon theory, I, you know, honest to goodness, you guys, I'm such a geek. I really had the thought of the matrix and the the chosen <laughs> child is sitting there going, it, the thing to remember is that the spoon doesn't exist. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> I really went all high tech and, you know, um, totally geeked out over it. But it is, if you will, scientifically, um, the spoon is a unit of energy based upon a personal story by a young woman with lupus, and her name is Christine Miserandino. And she was out in a restaurant with a good friend of hers, and she had had lupus, um, which is a chronic autoimmune disease, if you don't know what that is. Um, and the autoimmune, of course, means that the, um, your immune system is attacking your body's healthy cells. So she's trying to explain to her friend because she, her friend wanted to better understand the realities of living with chronic illness. So she's sitting there overwhelmed and she looks around and there's all these, she goes around to, I guess the place was relatively empty, but she goes over to these other tables and she collects all the spoons, right? She brings them back over and she puts them down in front, you know, and she's, she's gathered all these spoons and then she's like, 
okay, so I get up in the morning and she moves a spoon, you know, and then I brush my teeth and she <laughs> pulls away another spoon. And then um, she has to get dressed, right? There's another spoon. When you're healthy, you can combine some of those things that a chronically ill body has to literally break down into smaller units. But when you're chronically ill, each activity, each thing that you do, putting your shoes on, leaning down to tie them, right? All of those are separate activities. So we have to do the mm -hmm. same amount of things with an invisible illness, or we think we do, as a healthy person. And so you have literally, as a chronically ill person, used up six spoons and you just got to work. You still have to work, go to lunch, um, you know, uh, drive home, um, and then work a whole shift. Right, not yeah, just work your whole work. shift, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then come home, feed a cat or a dog if you have one, um, you know, make another meal and try and all this and you have like, you know, 15 spoons for the whole day. Mm. So that's why it's called the spoon theory. So she had done this and then she ended up writing a whole paper on it and it was, it's online and you can look up spoon theory and her name, Christine, and, um, and you can read all about it. And there's, it's, it's really kind of amazing because it it really has helped those with a, with chronic illness um, have something to identify with. You feel like there's there's even uh, terms out there. You, you're you're managing your life as a a spoonie. Um, so <laughs> it's it just gives you something that you can explain to those healthy people in your lives. And then, oh, that's the other thing. Um, she talks about in her spoon theory, she talks about the fact that a healthy person can often, if they really need to or want to, can borrow one or two spoons from the next day because when they lay down to get their rest, their spoons will be replenished much quicker than a, than a chronically ill person's spoons. If a chronically yep. ill person tries to borrow those spoons from the next day, they could be down for three days to two weeks because their mm -hmm. body doesn't recover as fast. And they've now mm -hmm. used and borrowed energy that they didn't have and they, you can't get it back. So what, what I think is really cool is that, uh, and really pretty neat, is uh, that, that I saw this theory in a support group for caregivers. Right. Because yeah. that means that they were communicating with that right. language. They were talking. They were often talking about their spouses, and they were often talking about reminding their spouses. Remember, you only have so many right. spoons, and stuff like that. So that's really neat to see that that was in uh, uh, being spoken of in a in a support group for the caregivers. Um, yeah, I was surprised I, when you said that you heard it in that format. It really kind of blew me out of the water. I was mm -hmm. actually encouraged by that. Um, it's such yes, a great absolutely. way to connect with others and express ourselves and work on self-compassion. Right. I, I have a yeah. quick question. Um, did we go over last time about what is chronic illness? I believe we did. Did we define? But so we, just in case... Um, Maybe this is your first episode and you didn't get last episode or, but chronic illness is anything that's not acute. So acute is. <laughs> Sorry. That word I was saying. <laughs> think of like little cute bunny rabbits. Or, or little cutie bitches. Or... I was thinking <laughs> acute me, yeah. which is a drama term, but that's okay. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So. Anything that is a I thought it was a yeah, yeah, cute. Thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> All right. So a chronic illness is anything that isn't acute. And acute means broken bone, bleeding from the head, you know, some kind of an immediate emergency that 
a physician, mm -hmm. doctor, you know, first responder can can fix, can can mend, and and even if it takes a few weeks to a couple of months, you will be healed. Mm -hmm. Everything it will right. be eventually. And your go life away. will go on as if it did never happen. Usually, so chronic illness then is is all of those things like cancer, uh, lupus, fibromyalgia, MS, uh, diabetes. diabetes. Diabetes is definitely a chronic illness. Uh, mental health also can fall under that <clears throat> that subheading as well. So, you know, your some of your depression and um, anxiety and all of those things that affect you on a long-term basis. They don't just go away. Polycystic ovarian there you go. syndrome, um, all the neuropathy. kinds of liver disease, heart disease, mm -hmm. um, yeah, all of that kidney disease, kidney yeah, disease. all that falls under chronic illness, especially those mm -hmm. that have to do repeated therapies like dialysis mm -hmm. or um, blood transfusions. Um, there's, I mean, any number of things, but that all falls under, mm -hmm. and then, and then. To clarify as well, a lot of people, um, and, and this is kind of something open to uh, interpretation, if you will. So cancer could technically be under the um, chronic illness umbrella, but most of the time cancer is kind of put under its own umbrella because yeah. it's different kinds of treatment. Um, and and there is really, especially now, with all of the new treatments and therapies and things, you actually can, add a, you know, go into remission, and some people literally are cured of their cancer. Or like yeah. you could have the kind of cancer that I had, um, which was uterine cancer. So a whole surgery took out my cancer, and my my, my cancer has it hadn't metastasized so once they removed which means right, spread so once they removed all of the cancer um and then i had you know they checked me for like the next five years or whatever and then i was done i was done with cancer i don't have any cancer anymore but i did have cancer um and i know right. some of the breast cancers other things like that so let's let's be clear though we're not in any way saying that cancer is not devastating no. that cancer is not Gosh, right. a type of chronic illness in a lot of yes. ways because yes. the amount of devastation that comes along uh -huh. with just receiving yes. that diagnosis yes. can yeah. be debilitating in its own right oh i know right and i think it's so scary it's hard to because cancer can the cancer <sighs> Cancer is a rapidly right. producing cell. That's what it is. And it chemotherapy goes in and it kills every rapid producing cell in your body. You know, bone marrow, white blood cells, red yeah. blood cells. It kills you kills them just enough to kill the right. cancer but not kill you. But because of all of that and putting that poison basically in your body to kill the cancer, it can also cause lymphedema it can cause uh, chronic illnesses, chron uh, separate chronic illnesses that you weren't even thinking or even right. on the spectrum of something. So there's a lot of like side effects of cancer and cancer treatments that can also lead into additional chemotherapies or uh, additional chronic illnesses, or even somebody who's had say stomach cancer and has had their stomach removed um, may have to learn a new right. eating lifestyle. Um, somebody who has had bladder cancer maybe had to have their bladder removed so they're urinating in a urostomy bag for the rest of their life, which is right. just like a colostomy yes. bag, but for urine. Um, and so those things, I mean, and then that becomes a chronic illness because then that that's like, it, it, it's right. totally unexpected for the cancer diagnosis that you got, say, maybe yes. a year or two ago. Yes. And then... Um, part of also why the spoon theory kind of came out is because lupus is under, under the definite umbrella of often invisible illness. So invisible illness then has, it's where, so often 
we can tell, okay, we can tell when somebody's in a wheelchair, right? Or has a limb missing mm -hmm. or often has been through most of the chemos because there's things like they lose their hair, they lose weight, right? There's all of these very, very on the outside ways that you can see that there there's an illness there, right? But for something like often uh, liver disease until they're jaundice or until they're at transplantation stage, um, lupus, um, MS, unless you're watching, you know, unless you're there when they actually fall and then you wonder why they fell because it looked like they tripped over air, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of um, invisible side effects, if you will. Things that the average person, or that, that, and that those of us who have them have learned how to kind of hide them, keep them quiet, right? We don't make a big deal about it out in the everyday because we actually really, most of us, at least from everybody that I've listened to, don't want to draw attention to it, you know? Um, for many reasons. Everybody has their reasons. Maybe it makes them look weak. Maybe it um, makes them, you know, they don't want to be the next somebody's hero. Whatever reason they have for keep, you know, wearing that mask of invisible illness, they don't want it to be out there in the public for everybody discussing it and talking about it and knowing about it. So that was a huge reason why Christine, who had lupus, was trying to share why she has to cancel sometimes, why she, why she can't mm -hmm. go to everything that everybody else goes to. And or right, multiple things she, can, per day. she has to pick and choose, you know. I remember just about, it's probably about three summers ago now, two summers ago, I, have to, I had to make a choice because I could go to church or I could go to the wedding that was going to be later on that day. But if I went to church, I wouldn't have enough energy to do, go to the wedding as well. And this was a young couple that I really admired and loved, and I really wanted to go to their wedding. So I had to kind of make a choice and say, this morning, I'm not going to go to church because that means I have to use up way more spoons than I would like to. Because I wanted to guarantee, I wanted to rest up so that I could do the wedding later on that afternoon. And, um, you know, and everybody has the, the things that they have to choose between and the things that they, the sacrifices, if you will. Um, but I think that the, the highest value that the spoon theory personally has for me is, is that it has helped me to understand myself better. And that's why I find the spoon theory helpful. Um, yeah. All right. So we've defined chronic illness versus acute illness. We've talked about what spoon theory is and how it can help and all of that. And, you know, um, I guess the other thing I just want to touch on briefly is that when we understand ourselves better, then we can actually be present more and we can we can do some of those things that we really want to do or we really enjoy doing to the fullest benefit if we understand how our body operates, right? So, right. you know, we were talking beforehand, Tina, um, before we got on tonight, that I overdid it on Friday. I just had major surgery and I went and I walked up a small hill and then I walked down to this pavilion area right next to the water. Then I walked back up this, another small hill. And then I stood, which I forget <laughs> how much energy actually takes just to stand. Um, and <laughs> when you've had major surgery, you don't realize that just standing sometimes is a big deal, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of overdid it, which meant that the activity that I had planned for Saturday night, I didn't get to do because I just, I didn't have enough energy. Right. There just wasn't. Because um, you borrowed then, too many spoons mm -hmm. from Saturday to yep. accomplish Because I really that. wanted that time with my granddaughter and I really wanted, 
that time with my son and his wife and and some other family that was in town it was it was very important to me to spend that time and so i had to give up what my other plans for saturday but luckily those those friends that i have um that i was doing something with on saturday um they both they both very much understand and actually respected me for making the healthy decision you need more of those people in your life those that will respect the healthy choices that that you're making please please surround yourself <laughs> more with those people all right i mean and you know and that even goes to so you you find out who your friends and family are like your true friends and family when you start having a chronic illness and you do have to um, sometimes cancel or not make an event or go something, you know, that you really wanted to do because, you know, if somebody asks you to come to something, it's because they, they want you there and, you know, you have to make that decision as to whether or not you're going to have the physical ability to be there. And if they're your true friends, they're going to understand that and you'll be able to make it up to them on a later date. Well, yes. And at another time, we're definitely going to I definitely want to do a whole podcast on emotional intelligence because I want to be, I want to be a little careful with making a statement like true friends because even true friends can not get it sometimes, not, they can, they can, you know, um, I don't, right. I don't know. I just want to be careful with, with how having said that because yeah, I think Sometimes it's important to understand that someone may not be completely like they, it's okay to be disappointed if your friend who has chronic yes. illness can't make it. It's okay mm -hmm. to be yes. disappointed. And right. it's even, I, I would like to think if they're a good friend, it's okay to verbalize that disappointment. But man, I really wanted no. you to come to this with me, but I right. understand. Um, but that is hard yes. to do as not only mm -hmm. a friend to folks who have chronic illness, because uh, I have a lot of people in my life, mm -hmm. Lori and EJ included, who, who have chronic illness, but right. my husband also does. And so I know that I spend most of my time making sure that the other person knows it's okay, that I often forget that it's okay for me to be disappointed Yes, I'm too. so glad you said that. I'm afraid to verbalize my disappointment because I know that this, uh, that the other person is disappointed and I don't want to add to their burden that they're already under. I don't want them to feel guilty that they couldn't, they didn't have. Which is such but a this perfect segue into our next segment. And it was completely on accident. Well, I, don't have I love it. So, see, you gave us a perfect segue. Um, with the bearing one another's burdens because I really wanted to talk about there's a scripture uh, Galatians 6 2 where it specifically tells us that as believers right that we are to bear one another's burden another scripture that I absolutely love is in Ecclesiastes and I want to say it's in chapter four is three or four but where it's talking about two are better than one so that when one falls somebody's there to pick them up four nine when, to twelve there you go four nine to twelve it is one of my all-time favorite scriptures because where two or more they're gathered a, th a three braided three strand cord is strong is not is not quickly broken yeah. yes i love that and the three strand cord of course is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then two other people, right? It's often used in a marriage um, mm -hmm. context. But I think it is great in the context of the relationships that we should have with our brothers and sisters, if you will, in the faith. And, and so having said those things, we now want to transition into what does it mean when you're a caregiver? And what where is your self care and and how do you not run into burnout right no. so mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and caregiver doesn't just mean somebody who's paid to take care of somebody like no. i know family it members means a family member yep. a friend who comes to give you a ride to a doctor's appointment yep. it means 
Um, the person who sits with you when you've been sick for a while and you just need an extra set of hands helping with some dishes or yeah. things like that. Like, and it could mean a caregiver at home. And, and, and some of this stuff is stuff that I've had to um, work on as my own as being a caregiver for somebody I don't know. But I've also been a caregiver to my parents. Um, and burnout is a real thing. Like, it, it, it truly yes. is. It's And it's I debilitating. Think... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the 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 caregivers that sometimes get overlooked are the spouses. Oh, yeah. amen. Because it's a it's a very complicated position to be in. Right. Yes. Um, yes. So I'm going to kind of give an example, but in a slightly different context because I think it fits. Mm -hmm. um, so my husband was offered uh, counseling. And that when he was first diagnosed to help him adjust and come to terms with his diagnosis, et cetera. And, you know, he was he was willing to give it a shot because, <laughs> you know, he thought he'd give me a break. And <laughs> uh, but so he goes and he, he sits through it and he, and he said she was a very nice lady. He, you know, she seemed really nice. But at the very end, he looked at her. He said, well, you know, ma'am, thank you for your time. But uh, my wife's a therapist and I think I'll just stick with her. <laughs> it's like wait wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute what <laughs> let's talk about roles here right you know? right yeah. so and i think that's an important word right there what are our roles oh yes so that, that goes along with it right mm -hmm. so how do you how do we define those right how do we you know i mean definitely okay so some things are defined simply on um, uh, kind of your Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So some things are defined basically out of out of just genuine senses of need, right? Mm -hmm. And and then some things are defined for us whether we want them to be or not based upon financial, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some things are defined like I remember when I first met Aaron, and I was one of the I know I was one of the the first, if not the first, to say, you do realize that you can't take care of your father, a double leg amputee, all by yourself. Like, this is not possible. You would have, not without some help, you would have to have help, you know. Because right, you the... were definitely attempting to do that. Right, yeah, because the facility was he after his second leg amputation, which wasn't like it was his second leg. It wasn't just another one on the same the one he'd right. already had the amputation right. on. It was his second leg. Right. Um, they were after a few months of rehab, they were planning to send him home, right? Um, because that's what he wanted at first. But when I realized that I was going to need to help take care of his diabetes, so give him shots because he has bad vision so he can't see to inject himself or to um you know just check his blood sugar um or to feel the the fingers because he has neuropathy so to feel the what do you call it the the like picking something up like he sometimes right. loses the feeling in his fingers at times yep. um so yeah they were training me to come to bring him home and i wanted to because i wanted to take care of my dad like I, that was what my, my heart was but yeah, Lori, you were one of the first and one of the few that I had talked to at the time. And they're like, you sure? you?" Because there was no way I would have been able to do that. And no. I and I started to get scared because I wanted to make sure my dad had the best care. Right. And it finally clicked that I could not, unfortunately, provide the best care for him. Right. Um, and as and much that's as a I, hard thing to come to grips with. Right. It, and, and I it, still struggle with it to this day. And it's been five years or more. Right six years it's it's kind of comes down to where does your role as daughter be end and yep. caregiver start yep, and exactly. caregiver end and daughter start yep. you know those are very distinct roles yeah. and mm -hmm. if you stay in that caregiver role you lose out on the benefits of being in the daughter role right, right which right. now i'm blessed with to be a daughter Yes. And I don't have to deal with the finances and I don't have to deal with the medical side. Now, I, I'm part of the care conference. We have discussions, how yes. he's doing and things like that. But it's more of a, I can be a sounding board for changes in medication or I can, you know, say, hey, my dad's talking a little weird today. You know, you know, what's going on? Right. 
you know, if, if something changes. And so I'm able to pick those up. And now I have a, a good relationship with my dad. Not that I didn't before, um, but the, the stress of being a caregiver on top of being daughter was, is definitely not there. Anymore. Yeah, right. And and the thing to consider for the person that you're giving care to, for them, and, and you guys can let me know if I'm off base on this, this but he has a role as a father. Yes. And if you're his caregiver, you know, that's that's a completely different role. Yes. I mean, Matt, that, that's like polar opposite. It role. is. Yeah. It is. And it is. that's that's sometimes can make their health worse. Oh, mm-hmm. Sadly, And yes. can lead to a depression and anxiety that that is already going to be there anyway, to some degree or other. Each person's different. But, mm-hmm. you know, so it's very complicated. It is. It is. I remember... After having my stroke, Emily and I had had a long talk in because I had to go to, um, you know, a full rehabilitation and learning how to walk and talk and do all this stuff again. And I was actually getting nervous about going home because, you know, I, for most of my son's lives, I was a single mom. And so I... I'm the referee, I'm the mom, I'm the I'm the everything, right? The chauffeur, I solve right. all the problems, you know, I I you know, um I'm kind of the center of that of that universe, right? And I knew that I my brain was functioning so differently after the stroke. And I was like Emily, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And she goes, guess what, Lori? Your sons are now young men, and they're going to have to, you know. And it took a really good friend, you know, stepping in and saying, Mm -hmm. I can help with this part of the conversation, you know. And she took the boys out, and she's just like, listen, your mom is a different person right now. She may go back to, you know, what she was before, but there's a possibility she may not. So you guys are going to have to, you can't go to her. You can't put her in the middle anymore and you can't, she can, Mm -hmm. she cannot be your problem solver. She's, she's barely functioning on what's the next word coming out of her mouth right now, you know? And it was great because it wasn't, it was so great to have a friend like her who could step in there and just say, let me, let me help you know, with this so that it's not all just on you and it's not all on you. And, and, right. and it was really great. I would suggest because each need is different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I would suggest that you definitely get professional help, but like there are case managers and social workers and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and unfortunately not all of them are great, but find yourself some good ones, um, get some advice. Um, but also, Find those trusted family and friends who are able to help share some of that burden. Because the idea, like like we've talked about in the scriptures, is that we are bearing one another's burdens. We're right. not supposed to be doing this alone. And it's really right. interesting, I think. Gosh, this could be a whole other topic. But I think it's really interesting that in an American society we often don't realize until a crisis hits that we're supposed to be doing this with other people. We are mm-hmm. so into pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, um, working, working hard, you know. Um, well, it's um, an independent thing. It is. We're very, very independent in this culture. Even though we, I don't think that's the way we were created. I don't think that's how we actually should be. But I confess, but it's, I, yeah, we just don't realize I was, it. I, when, so my mom had had cancer in 2010 and she got through chemo treatments and radiation and got a clean bill of health in 2011 and we went about two years and then she got the news that it had come back with a vengeance. And by then my dad had lost his second leg or his first leg. And I went from, you know, nothing you know, like kind of the shock of that to like taking care of both my parents at the same time. Right. I had one at the lower level of the house, one on the upper level of the house. Yeah. 
And so I remember being on the daughter's side of what you were just describing with Emily and Kevin mm-hmm. and your sons, mm-hmm. because um, I, I remember like I was taking on everything on my own. Like I was, it was really, really hard to ask for help because right. I figured I could, I'm like, I'm going to handle this on my own. I'm going to take care of this. Um, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm, you know, I, I mean, even at my mom's chemo clinic, when she went through chemo again, the, the nurses would call me her manager because I, I, I knew like what dose she got the previous time we were there. I got the, this day was this, this, you know, and so I had all that stuff down just out of the top of my right. head. Um, and so I remember all that, but I know my mom felt bad that I was taking on all that responsibility. Well, because especially in that parent child role, we right. just don't ever think until we're, you know, maybe in our, you know, late seniority that we're ever going to need that mm-hmm. kind of help. Right. Right. We honestly believe that we're going to be able to, we're supposed to take care of our children, not our children taking care of us, right. especially not at such a young age. I mean, you know, my boys were, you know, my, my son was having to make decisions between his Marine career and coming back home and helping take care of me, you know, so he's in his early, early 20s, you know, right. and, and you were what in your late, 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 late 20s, 20s, you know, going through all of that, anything in that you know, range from when we, you know, first leave home or, you know, get to college age and then, you know, up to about 30 is just yeah. such a, we don't believe that that's the role we're going to be taking in our parents' life at that stage. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, it, and I, you know, and I think my mom kind of saw, you know, cause there was, you know, there were times where we, it'd get tense in the house mm-hmm. where like somebody would have an argument cause something happened. Oh, yeah. Then like she'd see the house stressed I was. But I, I always made sure that I reminded her and my dad, like, I want to do this. Like, I'm here because I want to be here. And I always think back and I'm like, I'm grateful, like, that I wasn't ready to go off to college when I first went off. Because I might not have been living at home at the time when all this right. happened. Mm-hmm. And then I can only, I'm like, can I, like, I was thinking about this here not long ago. Though, like, the life I have right now, if I'd had that prior to my parents getting sick and needing help, mm-hmm. Would I have been able to drop everything and go home? Probably not. Right. And so we would have had to hire caregivers like me mm-hmm. to take care of them or things would have been different, you know? Yeah. Um, I guess that a lot goes so, into that, making those decisions, yeah. you know, where, where's and everybody? It's not, and it's not done lightly. No. And, you know, and it's hard because you get those case managers and those social workers who are like super passionate about their job and helping people. Mm-hmm. And that can really make a difference. And then there's those that just see you as another number on, you know, a paper or another prescription to write or, you know, and it's like, and, and in some ways, like a doctor and a nurse, they can only help with so much. Like they're the, there for the physical symptoms. They're not really there for the social kind of help of, you know, like finding, you know, here's a pamphlet of like, the case managers you can call or, right. you know, that's about, it. that's the extent of their help, right. you know, right. caregiving agencies. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Which is great. You know, that is a help, but then it's like making those phone calls. And that's when like, I should have said, okay, I need some extra help doing this. And I have, and I, I, my mom had some friends that kind of came in and helped for certain things, but I, I, I confess I took on most of it myself because I'm like, nope, I'm going to do it. I'm independent. I can handle this. So that would, so let's say we've, we've made decisions and you've gotten to that point and you, you find yourself in that caregiving role. I'm the type of person that's like, okay, how do I set myself and others up for success? This is kind of like, one of the first things that I try to think about, you know, is, okay, now that I'm here, this is the decision I made. How do I set myself up for success with, within this? And I think that it is very, very important for caregivers to engage in self-care or you will burn out. I mean, there's just, there's nothing, there's no questions about it. You will burn out. If you don't engage in self-care. It, anyway, it's yeah. funny because 
I was just sitting here while I was listening to you guys talk about this, thinking about, I think that um, if you were to go to a spoon store, you would find a set of spoons for mm-hmm. chronic ill people. Mm-hmm. You would find a set of spoons for caregivers. You would say, you know, like this. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, yeah, I think. I like that. Great. That's a great. I like that. That's cool. <laughs> we each have our own set of spoons. I like that. And, and right. it's interesting. That's why the, the spoon is literally just a, a measurement, a unit of measurement, you know. Mm-hmm. And and everybody has different units, right? And they have different amounts. And so you could have forks. There you go. Or a combination of <laughs> forks, knives, <and> spoons. <laughs> you could have a spork <laughs> or a strainer because everything just <laughs> <falls out laughs> everything falls out of it. Oh, you guys, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, um, so let's say you find yourself in this position and you're a caregiver. So I would say the first thing that you want to remember, and I I know it's going to sound crazy, but this is the first thing you need to do. You want to try to do something nice for yourself. (laughs) Guess what? You actually really do deserve it. So what I'm talking about is often it, 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 sometimes it can be once a week, but at a minimum once a month. Okay. So a massage, getting your nails done, um, pedicures, um, go to the movies, um, what's your favorite place to go out and eat, you know, uh, coffee, um, whatever. Read a damn book. Read a book, for goodness sakes. Yes, I like that. Read a book. Because <laughs> um, often as caregivers, you don't have time for that. Um, mm-hmm. Whatever it is. That's what audiobooks are for. Oh, hey, man, you listen to one, that. there you go, but... But the idea is you have to do something nice for yourself because not only do you deserve it, but as I'm sure Tina can explain better, but when you're involved in self-care, there's what? Um, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Um, like what? Serotonin? Right? Is that the word I'm looking for? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's one of them. And then there's, you know, hormones and there's all of these feelings that go along with, I'm not the counselor, um, with doing something nice for yourself, right? So I'm going to throw this over to T, who can like throw all those professional words in there. So, so yeah, so here's the thing is that self-care is a dynamic concept. Yes. And it sounds simple. It sounds like, oh yeah, well duh. But it's <laughs> not duh. And I'm I'm gonna kind of preface this with a little bit of self disclosure. If you don't do things like self care, you don't get a chance to check in with yourself to see how you're doing. Amen. If you don't get a chance to check in with yourself to see how you're doing, you have a stroke. Right. Or you have a heart attack. Or you have yeah. these things that happen that now suddenly you are not able to help that other person. So you have to invest in yourself as much as you're investing in others. Now, that being said, it doesn't have to be these big, ginormous things. Right. Like if you can do a massage, awesome. Go do it. Pedicure, go do it. But sometimes it can be even less than that, but you have to give it intention. Yes. For some people, it's meditation. It's prayer. It's reading a book. It's sitting down and writing something to to yourself or drawing or something that gives you a sense of contentment and peace, right. even for moments, because they go a long way. Because as Lori was kind of uh, getting to, is it does release those hormones and those chemicals that are counter to the stress hormones like cortisol, right? Um, and so they and so. It allows for healing in the body. It allows for um, you just to kind of come back to center and to be able to um, keep moving forward. And a little bit of coming back to center, that's called homeostasis. Our very Every cell in our body, every cell desires to go back to the middle. Mm. Do that, we're, you know, when we're doing those things, it allows us to do that. Oh. I love that. Where we operate at our healthiest and at our best. 
Yep. So, oh, amen. Um, so self care is just anything that gives you a moment. Amen. I love it. I love it. I love it. I was thinking that really does kind of lead into the next thing that I was going to say, which is that it's really, really important to engage in your own healthy goals. So mm -hmm. sleep, eating, taking breaks, meditation, mindfulness, exercise, and the list could go on. But, you yeah. know, that it, it's so important that you get enough sleep, that you... Um, that you're eating properly, that you're right. And what's the thing that goes, you know, one of the first things to go is eating healthy, right? I, I have five minutes here. I have two minutes here. I got to do this. I got to run here. It's okay if I skip this meal. No, it's really not okay. You know? So, because once you start engaging in that behavior where you're not having your own healthy boundaries with, with, for yourself, with what, with, what is good for you, then that just all falls away. And next thing you know, like you said, like T said, you're having a stroke, you're having a heart attack, you're, and then you're unable to do the care that you want to do because right. your body right. says, nope, time out, stop, I quit. <laughs> and, and I want to, I want to mention something because it's so easy to talk about these things as if, oh yeah, any of us can, we can all do this. I want to address something real yeah. quick that, that I think is super important. We as caregivers, as the closer we are to the person we're caring for, the more guilty we feel for feeling healthy. Oh my goodness gracious. You hit the nail and on the head. So when we feel healthy, we feel our, 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 for me, it's my significant other or my close dear friends. I, I feel okay. I can, I can go do these things, but my significant other can't. Right. And, right. Right. And if I'm taking care of myself and I'm healthy, it, so let me see if I can give an example. So like there's times where I don't do things around the house that I might normally do because I like cleaning. I'm kind of a dork that way. But me too. <laughs> if my if my husband isn't feeling good, I sometimes will put that off because I feel like I'm putting it, shoving it in his face that I can. Mm, interesting. It's probably and a good thing if you guys I should actually go talk somewhere. about. Well, we do, so that helps. But it's but it's something that happens underneath that we're not always aware that we're feeling. Yeah, I I yeah. think one of my aha moments, and I may have talked about this before, but one of my aha moments is I was sitting there and I was feeling overwhelmed, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I could just use a break. I just need to get away. And I'm, it wasn't just my my husband's situation, but. You know, it's, I've got a taxing job too. Mm -hmm. It wears you down. Yep. And I was thinking, oh, if I could just get away and just escape for a little bit. And then I had this thought of, but he can't. Right. No. And it was like a punch in the mm. gut because I'd never had the actual thought before, but I'd been operating on that thought yes. without realizing that. Mm. And so I had to take a look at that and go, oh, so what does that mean? Does that mean I shouldn't take a break? No, that's not what it means, yeah. but I had to question that. Right. Should I not take my break? Should I not have fun? Should I not do these things? Because he can't, and I feel bad that he can't. Mm. He's not asking that. Right. As a matter of fact, him, you know, talking to him about that makes him feel bad because he doesn't want that for me. Right. And right. so it's this double-edged sword that you're all, it's just, if you can pull the sword out <laughs> and look at it, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you can put it away for a while well I mean and it, you think about you know when you are on a plane and the plane starts going down and those masks come down mm -hmm. that's the first thing they put tell your you own to mask do. on put your own mask on first right. because you can't you're not going to be a help to the person or your family member or your person you're caring for mm -hmm. If you can't take care of yourself. Amen. Right. Amen. But I think so, it's still super important to acknowledge how much you want to take care of that other person yes, first. Yes. Right. Exactly. But yeah. That, and that so, and that's, that's where. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where the boundaries and learning, learning yourself, like Lori was talking to, about earlier too, is, you know, learning and being aware of the situation you're in and not just trying to gloss over it or, 
pretend it's not right. there because yep. it's a reality. It is. And, and I also want to say something too is caregiving is yeah. tough and it's not for everybody. So if you ever come to a situation where a family member is sick or has become ill to a point where they need in-home care, it's okay to ask Amen. for help. You don't have right. to do it alone. And while it may be challenging to figure out who can help, there yes. is help out there. Yes, there is. You know, it's interesting. Um, so we've definitely gone right into the next little thing that I was going to mention, which is having and setting boundaries and knowing your limitations. So you've definitely touched on that, EJ, in that I think it's really, really important to know your limitations and and to learn, you know, I mean, we've talked about, you know, masks of communication, right? We need to understand how do we communicate those needs, those desires, those those things in a, in a healthy way. And because we have to learn how to do that. And if we don't, then we can't set the, the, the boundaries that we need. And then again, as we keep saying, you're headed to burnout. You're headed to frustrations. You're headed to hurt feelings. You're headed to, you know, so much heartache, really, because you, we don't know how to communicate needs and desires and 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 um, these boundaries that that need to be very delineated because that actually makes life so much easier. We think it's, I don't know, I've always thought setting boundaries was very cumbersome and difficult. And then mm -hmm. when I saw what setting boundaries did, I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? Like my life would have been so <laughs> much better if I just, right? I just right. I had no idea because I think there's this, yeah. this expectation that setting boundaries is is selfish setting boundaries is um right. being forceful or too assertive or i mean whatever connotation or adjective you would like to stick in the front of that i think we do that you know i'm not sure if there's some psychological thing about that and why we do that or whatever but i just think it's something that we do and i when i actually have set a boundary and stuck with it i have felt so much relief and so and I've had so much success with it and I'm like why didn't I do that sooner my life would have been so much better but you know hindsight is always 2020 one of the things I work on with clients is <laughs> so setting boundaries is like um hang on I lost my turn of thought I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> it's like you must have sensed the steam coming out of my ears. <laughs> I was like, well, I can maybe find it for you. <laughs> I had it too. It's something I, this is something I actually work on clients with a lot is they assume that I found Good. it. Okay. So, the reason in setting boundaries is important isn't just for your own sake, but it's for the other person's sake Amen. too. Because when you don't mm -hmm. set, about, set boundaries, when you don't tell people what you think, you're telling, you're communicating to them, I don't trust you. Oh. Mm -hmm. Ouch. I don't trust you to do the right thing. I don't trust you to be able to handle the tough stuff. I don't trust you to be able to step up to the line and do your part. Oh my goodness gracious. Wow. Whew, whew, that was tough. Need to marinate on that one a little bit. Um, yeah. So it's, it's one of my motivating talks. Can you yeah. tell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, it it's something that I I st I personally still struggle with. But it was awareness I came up I don't know a long time ago because someone didn't want to tell me something because they were afraid of hurting my feelings or that I couldn't handle it. And I went, wait a minute, I, I'm not so such a wimp, I can't handle it. 
And so then I started thinking, well, how many times have I done that to someone mm. else? Not told them, not set a boundary, not said no, not whatever, because yeah. I didn't want to hurt their feelings. And that's what I was communicating to them is they can handle yeah. it. Mm. And people yeah. surprise you on how much they can handle. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, and boundaries can be small and they can be large. Like if you know that you can only handle one event a day and you know that your body is only going right. to handle that one thing, you set that boundary. And then if a second event comes up, then you have to, like we were talking earlier, you have to make a choice as to which event. It could be the one that came first, the one that was scheduled first, or it could be the one that only comes around like right. once in a blue moon. Whereas... You know, or it could be something great, like big, like, I, I don't know, like my boundary is I'm going to do self-care once a week and no matter what, it doesn't have to be like a specific day, but you like once a week, you got to get it in. You've got to get that in because, you know, when we're tired, we can start getting weak in the physical sense. Like if we, we could fall easily the caregiver or the person right. who they're taking care of. Like if they haven't had enough sleep and they try to get up and go walk somewhere, they could fall because they're too tired or too weak because they're not taking care of themselves. Um, or if you're caring for somebody and you go and helping them walk to the bathroom and you stumble because you're unsteady because you're tired, right? that could pull them down. Right. So then both of you right. can get hurt. This is true. I see it like this. I have every I I have paperwork right. That's just part of my job. Mm -hmm. But I have such a busy schedule; it's sometimes hard to get to my paperwork. So I set mm -hmm. it up so that Tuesday mornings are my protected time right. mm -hmm. to do my paperwork, and that's how it is in my schedule. If I don't mm -hmm. take that protected time, I end up uh, with a stack. Of papers right. that takes me so much time to get in and out once I'm not given each each note the time it deserves and then if I need it later if I need to go back to that note what was I even talking about there what was that about what was this two word sentence thing I mean that doesn't tell me anything about that session yeah. so you know and 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 so I don't put the quality into it because I'm rushing yeah. it to get everything in on time so but if I take that protected time I don't have to worry yes. about that. I was going to say, too, there's yeah. also, and I, I know there's research to back this up, but you call it protected time. It's always best to schedule that, to not just leave it to, I'm going to do it sometime in a week, mm -hmm. because more often than not, it won't get done. You have to actually schedule it and then follow through with it. And again, I, I yes, emergencies happen. We do mm -hmm. have to be flexible in life, but as a general whole, I really liked what you called it to protected time because yeah, without right. that, the rest of your life is so much more difficult. So we do have to protect that because right. by protecting that time, you're protecting yourself. Right. Social workers call it that. Oh my gosh. I love it. They yeah. have to have protected time so they can get their paperwork. I love it. It's a great idea. I really like mm. it. Yeah. yeah, I think it to me it makes perfect sense that social workers came up with it. So of course, you know, <laughs> we could keep talking about this for a very long time, but there are. Oh, I was just gonna say, if you guys want to know more about boundaries, um, there's an amazing book called Boundaries: When to Say Yes, How to Say No, Amen. to Take Control of Your Life, um, written by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. And so there's boundaries, and then they also have an entire series of books: boundaries with kids, boundaries oh, with yeah, dating, yeah. boundaries, boundaries with, parents, with everything. Boundaries with I teens. love those books. Not great, but there's workbooks that go along. Say that again, T. Boundaries with boundaries, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So if you guys are interested, check those out. You can buy. I think you can buy an ebook on Amazon and. You know, that's, those are really good resources. So that's, right, um, go ahead. I'm saying, in fact, I started reading it um, when I started going to church and I heard about it. That was the first time I'd heard about it. And uh, about a year later, um, when I was going through my training to get my home care aid certification, the teacher brought it up 
to read that book as well, because as caregivers, we need to have boundaries as well. So in two different aspects of my life, it came up. So it's not just for somebody who's a Christian or just somebody who's this. Yes, it's, it's good for it's anybody. Good for anybody. Which, which really kind of leads me into the next thing. Of course, we could talk about this, right, for a long time. But there are ways to educate yourself outside of our podcast, outside of, you know. Um, so, of course, you can go to the library, you can go to the Internet, you know. Um, I do like to remind people when it comes to research, be careful where that research comes from. Be careful, you know, where you get. I, I don't tend to do a lot of dot .com um, stuff. Mostly because um, that's driven by revenue and ads, and I don't necessarily feel like it's not it. Well, it's not peer reviewed. It's not from a, a specific organization or you know somebody that really knows what they're talking about. And and I'm all for listening to podcasts because I want people to listen to our podcast and every other one out there, right? But but. I really like, you know, we put that disclaimer in the beginning and the end about we're, we're not to replace any kind of medical and, you know, we are just three women trying to live authentically. We are not the end all be all. We are not the gospel on these things. Just because Lori T or EJ said something does not mean you need to go out and do it like right now. We are just talking about it, being real and authentic and looking behind our own masks and hopefully helping each other and others while we're doing that. So definitely educate yourself, explore your community resources. There are so many books um, on caregiving, on chronic illness, um, on, on, you know, any number of things. So whether you're an audible person and you want to listen to it or you want to buy the book or get the resource manual, whatever you want to do, please, please, please explore your community resources and do your homework. I know um, EJ brought up the Boundaries book. Um, there's a really good book out there called Fearless Caregiver, uh, the Fearless Caregiver Manifesto. It's an exceptional book if you find yourself. Um, also, there is, I believe it's online now. I'm not sure if it's still in written publication, but it's called Today's Caregiver Magazine and it has tons of resources, tons of products, all kinds of things to help you as the caregiver in your everyday life. So those are a couple that I can throw out. Um, T, um, I, isn't your YouTube channel kind of based upon... You're, well, you call it life's lesson, uh, but yeah, it, it um, it's been a while since I've uh, put anything up on there, and I've only got a couple things up on there. Most of it's just critical thinking, Great. basically. Um, so, but I I would be happy to put out a like a self care video or um, setting boundaries. I've done some assertive communication stuff. Um, right. I think the next one I'm going to be working on is um, social anxiety. Ooh, that's a good hot Not topic really. right now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I definitely could, if anybody has anything that they they want more information on or would like a more of a mental health approach on a topic uh, or anything along those lines, I'd be happy to do it. Yes. Okay. So before we end, wrap this up. There's one more thing that I want to say. I was in a, uh, I think it was a prayer group the other day, and somebody brought up um, the idea of the spoon theory, but how it didn't really line up with their faith. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Why doesn't the spoon theory line up with your faith? Um, <clears throat> I think that... And, and I, I know I'm going to kind of bring up something touchy here, but I feel it needs to be talked about. This, we have to know ourselves, right? We have to know our limitations. We have to know our bodies. 
And then we have to be able to, we have to learn to speak up about those things. And when we do that, sometimes I think it will appear to come into conflict with the idea of faithful, sacrificial living. Um, and I, I guess I want to, I want to challenge that a little bit. And I want to say, who are we as followers ultimately answering? If we are saying we're a follower of Jesus Christ, a, um, a believer in God, right? And that the, the Holy Spirit leads us, who are we answering to? When, when, you know, at the end of the Bible, when it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, it's not to each other. It's literally to God. And again, it's not that, please don't take that wrong. It is not that fellowship isn't an, a very important part of your walk with God. It's not that I'm trying to say, don't go to church on Sunday or, you know, skip on a midweek every time that, you know, you don't feel well. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you have to listen to your body. You have to make wise, healthy choices. And sometimes that will bump up against what would be considered a healthy person's version of sacrificial living. Any thoughts, ladies? I have a question. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have my Bible right in front of me and it's not something I've read in a, in a while. I've been focused on some other stuff. But um, didn't Paul have to pause his missions at times? to attend to his illness. I think you did. Um, I might have to go. Yeah, we might have to look that up. Because I believe that Paul at times could not continue and had to send others on in his stead because he was ill at times. Because if I remember correctly, he had an illness that, like a chronic illness. <laughs> did yes, he, he have a thorn? About embracing his thorns. Um, but I think I, I'm not a theologian, so I think this is definitely something that we can come back to, and I would love to, because, you know, I've been having this discussion with my own counselor right now, because, you know, with the surgery that I just had and all the changes that I'm making in my life, I have literally said to my counselor, isn't that selfish? Like, wait a minute, where where does God fit into that? I think it's really important to... um to define for yourself what that sacrificial living looks like. And it is something that you have to answer <clears throat> to God about. Um, I often have talked, you know, I'll have different people in <clears throat> that will say to me, well, when do I, when do I determine whether I don't go to church or I don't? Do? And I'm like, oh goodness, I'm not going to answer that for you. Um, I, what I will say is that you know your body and you know what it's capable of right and what and you can also if you will be honest examine your intention and you can say am i not going to this meeting because of my illness or am i not doing such and such because my body is physically restricting me or do i just feel like being a little lazy today and, and that's, I mean, you know, you, you need to answer those questions for yourself. Um, am I, is this really a physical limitation that I don't feel like I should healthily cross? Or do I want to choose, this is when I want to be sacrificial, right? And so, you know, any other thoughts on that, ladies? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. Um, I also think this is also a good time to say, you know, remember, there's also many scriptures many in Proverbs about seeking advice. And this isn't a decision yeah. you have to make by yourself. So if there's a time when you're unsure if you should attend an event, like, for example, the church I attend has been meeting virtually for the last year and a few months. And recently, the phases have shifted enough that we could start meeting back in person in a limited capacity 
And so I had to weigh the pros and cons. Thankfully, I have been vaccinated. So I, even though I'm not a 100% nobody you know, is protected against the virus, I definitely have some immunity to it. So I made the decision to start attending in person. Right. Everybody's not going to be in that same position. Some people may decide not to attend in person for a while longer, and that's okay. And oftentimes we can use our illness to teach others because i'm sorry i'm not the energizer <laughs> really i thought for sure <laughs> as you much were. as i want to be <laughs> as much as i want to be and so i've had to learn that you know i've had to learn of just being mindful of what the event is and communicate if i'm not attending that's another thing if I choose not to go to a midweek or a Sunday service or a, a meeting of the group, whether it's online or in person, I'm not just going to not show up. I'm going to say send a message to a few of the people that I know will be there and say, hey, you know, sorry, I won't be there, but I'm not feeling well. Because then that's also showing a maturity Amen. of acknowledging that I'm not attending, yep. but I'm letting you know that I'm okay or that I'm not feeling well, but yep. I'm taking care of myself. I think that that's key. Communication. Uh, we keep coming back to communication. It seems to be one very central thing we all need to figure out a little better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's key think to it a is. lot. T, anything else you want to add? No, I think overall we've covered uh, quite yeah. a bit. Just a friendly reminder that anything discussed in this podcast is not to be used as a diagnosis or a replacement for conversations with our own doctors, therapists, psychologists, or other medical professionals. This episode is available on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Behind the Mask PC, and we'll soon be on YouTube. If you don't use social media, you can email us at behindthemaskpc at gmail.com. Feel free to review us on Anchor, leave feedback on the platform you listen to us on, or message us through our social media or email because we'd love to hear what you think. If there is a topic you'd like to hear us talk about, feel free to message us and we'll see about making it happen. You can find EJ on Twitter and Instagram as EJ8302 and T at her YouTube channel, T's Life Lessons. If you'd like to help keep these episodes coming, you can monetarily support us by visiting anchor.fm slash behind the mask PC slash support. And on behalf of Lori, T, and myself, thank you for listening and we'll talk All to you right. next time.